Uh, today I want to share with you, uh, it's, in, it's titled, uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Why do bad things happen to good people? And this is a question that, to be honest with you, is something that I struggled early in my faith. Because I've known many people, many wonderful people, many faithful people in Christ. Well, I would, you know, I look at them and I say, you know, I've known people that has lost their jobs. I've known people whose business failed. Uh, one of the dearest church members that I knew died of a cancer a while back. And the question that I would often ask, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? What is the meaning behind it? What's the purpose? You know, if God is so powerful, if God is so almighty, why does he allow these bad things to happen to good people. Today I want to address that. First of all, I don't have all the answers because I am not God. But there are certain principles and examples in the Bible that are given to us that gives us ideas and clues as to why do bad things happen to good people. Today we're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. Please read along with me together. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. Let's begin. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with His comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighted down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. Again, this is the question for the ages. I'm sure every one of us in this room have one time or another asked ourselves that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? If God is so real, if God is so powerful, why does He allow bad things to happen to good people? Again, I cannot give you the answer for every situation because I am not God. And I wish I can tell you that there's good reason for everything. I wish I could, but I can't. Again, because I am not God. But again, I will try to shed some light today as to what are some of the reasons that God tells us through the scripture that why sometimes bad things happen to good people. It's easy to understand when bad things happen to bad people because oftentimes the bad things that happen to them are brought upon by their own decisions, by their own choice, by their own lifestyle. And oftentimes bad things happen to bad people. Why? Because they choose to dwell in evil and in sin. And when you surround yourself in that type of situation and environment, it's not too difficult to understand why bad things happened to bad people. But when bad things happen to good people, that is another story. We ask ourselves, you know, we did everything right. We made all the right choices. Then why is it that bad things happen to good people? Why is it that bad things? Why do people close to us get into car accidents? Why do bad people get sick and die at an early age? Why do, bad, why do good people get fired? Why do good people lose their job and, and, or you know, have a failed business? Why do these bad things happen to good people? There are three, re three things that I want to share with you today. The first thing that I want to share with you as to why good thing, I mean, bad things happen to good people. Number one, Bible teaches us that the reason why bad things happen to good people is so that we, we may become better ministers to others. The ver in, the verse that was, in the verses that we read today, in verse 4, it says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When we are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. In this verse, Paul is telling us that one of the main reasons why God allows pain and suffering to enter our lives is so that we may become better ministers to others. That we may better help others who are hurting. You know, years ago, uh, back in Houston, we had a guest speaker one time. And believe it or not, he was an Asian man. But what, uh, what made his story so unique was that he was one of the few Asian men that was in a, one of the mafias in New York. Strange. It's hard for Asian, but he was. 
In fact, he said that he was actually on an, uh, at one time uh, uh, FBI's top 10 wanted list, which is very hard to believe. But then he says, one day, to make the long story short, you know, he met God. He decided, you know, he met God, he encountered God. You know, life was falling apart. You know, what happened was that he got arrested. And when he got arrested, you know, the mafia tried to interrogate him. And what happened was that while he was in captivity, the other mafia members put a bounty on him because they, they, said to, they thought to themselves, this man is going to rat on us. He's going to tell on us. He's going to tell the FBI everything about us. And in the end, when we get captured, he's going to testify against us in court. So he said that they put a bounty. Bounty means that they put a reward out for him. Whoever kills this man, you know, we will give you I don't know, ten thousand dollars, twenty or thirty thousand dollars. It was in that moment he said that he turned to God, God that he knew at an early age when he used to go to church. And he confessed his sin. He said, "Lord, forgive me." And he genuinely said he gave his life to Christ. And after that, guess what? He said to himself, "Well." You know, the mafia, they put a hit out on me. I am, you know, arrested. The FBI says, if you tell us everything, then we might go easy on you. So he decided, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to tell them everything. Even though that by doing so, it's going to make the mafia even more angry. And my life will be even greater danger. Well, he did all that. He testified. And, uh, and because of what he did, uh, he was given a, a lighter sentence. After his, uh, he went to prison for a little while, and after that, when he came out, the government put him on a, a witness protection program. What that means is that once you get out of prison, they don't let, just let you out. They put you in a, some suburb or some place out of nowhere, and they give you a new identity, new name, and so forth. And you kind of live in, you know, underground, incognito, you know, where nobody knows you with a new identity. But then, you know, after, as he was, you know, as his faith in God grew, he said to himself, this is not the way I want to live, and this is not the life that God has called me to. And what he decided to do was, you know what? If, if mafia decides to kill me, so be it. I'll take my chances. But I'm going to spend my life helping others who are in similar situation that I was in. A young age, running away from home, getting into you know, crime, a life of crime, and then getting deeper and deeper in until your life is totally now lost. And he said, you know what? I'm going to help, those. I'm going to help these young men so that they won't make the same mistakes that I'll make, that I made. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to spend the rest of my life, I'm going to travel from city to city, talking to young people about my life and warning them about, you know, what lies ahead. So he, he made a commitment. He went from, you know, state to state, church to church, knowing that, you know, any, at any time, somebody could come and shoot him and take his life. But one of the things he said was, you know, I believe, you know, my past, was not just accident, was not an accident. The way God saved me, the way God, you know, the, you know, I got caught one time and the fact that he got caught, he got arrested, the way, you know, the fact that his mafia people put a, you know, a bounty on him, he says, you know, I don't think this is an accident. I think God allowed my past to happen for a reason, so that I can better minister to other people. Now, this example is a little different than the, you know, the example that I gave earlier about why do God allow pain and suffering? But the principle is this. Oftentimes, God allows pain and suffering to come into our lives so that we may better minister to other people. In a church that I served at in Houston, we had a children's pastor. Her name was Mrs. So. Sweet lady. I mean, she, she is now 64, 65 years old. And she just retired last year. Sweet lady, about this tall, you know, and... It's amazing, lady that old, she's doing children's ministry, singing and dancing and doing all that. But what made her story so amazing was that she has four, four children and all of them are daughters. Amazing, four daughters. That's really hard to find in Korean community. She has four daughters. And at an early age, her husband left her. And his explanation was, God told me that I cannot do God's work with you, so I'm going to leave you. He's crazy, basically. And he left her. Her life was devastating. She said to, her, she, you know, said to herself, what am I going to do? I have four children. 
I've never held a job. I've been totally dependent on my uh, husband up until this time. What am I going to do? She, says to her, she said to herself, how am I going to raise my four daughters all by myself? Well, the story had an happy ending in that she did raise them, four beautiful girls. In fact, two of them were part of uh, in my ministry, and I ministered to them. It was very difficult, to, to say the least, for Mrs. So. It was very difficult for her, for her to go back to school. She went to seminary, got a uh, Christian education degree. It was very hard for her to feed the family and make money and to keep them safe and teach them to do doing the right things. But God helped her to raise her four daughters well. And she eventually got a position as children pastor at a church. And now she, she's, I mean, she's served there for about 15 years and now she's retired and she's going to do mission work in China. But one of the things that she did besides ministering to children was this. In our church, she would often visit different family groups, house churches that we have. And she would often visit, and when she visits, she, she visited house churches, especially with women. Women whose husband either passed away or was single because they were divorced. And you know, a sad testimony about the state of our country, but you know, there's so many of you know, women like that nowadays where they're divorced and they're alone and raising children by themselves. Or some of them, their husband passed away and they're alone. And she visits them quite regularly. And she meets with them quite regularly. And she shares with them her story, her struggles, how difficult it was for her to raise four daughters in San Francisco area of all places. How hard it was for her to go to school during the day and then come home at night, take care of her children. It was hard for her to live off of a part-time salary, raising four children, living in a you know, school dormitory. And she shares her story with other women who are struggling, who are devastated because they're alone. And she tells me and she tells others, you know, I'm not going to say that this is what God had planned for me, but what I do know is that I know what God wants me to do with my past and my experience. God wants me to use this to help other people. God wants me to use my past to comfort others. See, we don't know exactly why God allows bad things happen to good people. But maybe one of the reasons is because God wants us to become better ministers. You see, this is the reality. If you've never had pain and suffering in your lives, if you've always lived a comfortable life, it's very hard for you to minister to others because you can't relate. You can't tell someone, I know how you feel. You can't be there with someone and cry with them when really you don't know exactly what they're going through. But when you've been in their shoes, when you've gone through the pain and the suffering, then it's easier for it to relate with other people's pain. And you can empathize. Helping you to better comfort others. Again, sometimes God allows pain and suffering in our lives, not necessarily to punish us, but more so to prepare us to comfort others, help those who are in need. Second reason why God allows suffering and tragedy into our lives is so that, the Bible tells us, so that we may become more obedient. So that we may become more obedient. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it reads, Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Now, what does that mean? Learning obedience from suffering. See, the writer of the Hebrews states that Jesus learned to be a better obedient servant because of the past suffering that he endured. You know, a while back, I don't remember, I saw, I, I remember hearing this. I heard a story about a rich man and a poor man, and they say that you know, if a rich man and a poor man, if both of them go to jail, go to prison at the same time, a rich man cannot make it because, he was, because he's so used to the life of luxury and comfort, while the poor man will have no problem with a life in prison, for he's used to a life of hardship and suffering. Again, the point of the story is this. 
It's hard to be obedient when we live such a comfortable life. It's hard for us to obey God when our life is filled with so much comfort. But if we're used to a life of discomfort, if we're used to a life of somewhat of a little suffering, you know what? It helps us to become more obedient when God does call us to His ministry. See, when we experience hardship, we'll have a greater capacity to do more and endure more. See, God doesn't call us to live a life of luxury. That's not the reality. God does not call us to live a life of comfort. He doesn't. Oftentimes, when God calls us, He calls us to do things that are difficult, that will bring hardship into our lives. And you see, unless we have experienced that type of hardship and endured that kind of suffering, it will be very difficult for us to be obedient to God when He calls us. Let me ask you this question. What if today, God said, you heard a voice, and God said, I want you to go to Afghanistan for two years and be a missionary in that country. What would you say? How would you respond? There are a few, few, you know, few responses that you could give. Number one, you might say, oh, God, no, <laughs> not Afghanistan. If you, if you send me to Paris, I'll go. You know, if you send me to, you know, Frankfurt or Berlin, I'll go. If you send me to Shanghai, I'll go. But Afghanistan, oh no, I'm not going to go. God, you got the wrong person. Second response might be, oh God, give me some time to think about it some more, God. I'm not ready yet. And you might do it, but, it might, but you might take about, you know, a couple of months to really convince yourself or prepare yourself. But then there's some of you who might say, when God says, I want you to go to Afghanistan for two years, and some of you will say, God, really? Okay, I'll go. Let me say this, let me be honest with you. If God were to tell me right now, Paul, I want you to go to Afghanistan for two years on a mission trip, probably my answer would be all three. Are you sure? You sure you don't want me to go to uh, you know, Paris again <laughs> for mission, not Afghanistan? But I'll say, God, I have wife and children. They're not ready. Give me a little bit of time. But God, yes. And the reason why I can say yes is this. Because I've been to Afghanistan three times. And I know that you know, I've, you know, for about one month, I slept on a dirt floor. I had flea bites all over. You saw the picture, some of you. You know, I'm used to eating rice and uh, none every day. I'm used to not eating Korean food for a month. But more than that, I've been to Mexico several times. I slept in 100 degree heat underneath the tree. I slept with dogs in the same room. I'm used to that. I lived in a place where they, had, they didn't have toilet. In fact, it was just an open area, just you know, separated by a wall, and that's the bathroom. I'm used to having diarrhea. I'm used, you know, I'm used to all that. And because of that, I understand that, you know, it's okay. It's not that bad. I've done it before. You see that some of the hardships and difficulties in our lives, God gives to us because God wants us to be better obedient, more obedient servant. For those of you who are single, what if God told you, I want you to go to an orphanage, and I want you to serve at an orphanage? What would you say? Some of you say, oh, I love children. But many of you, you'll say, you kidding? Me? I don't know how to change a diaper. I don't know what to do when baby cries. You know, I'm a man. I don't know how, even how to hold a baby. Do you hold them like this? You know? But if God were to tell that to some of the older people who's raised children, who's had many, and you know, who's raised their own children, maybe even had grandchildren, for someone who says, you know, oh, it's hard work, but, you know, I've done it before. Maybe I can do it again. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7, it reads, So be truly glad. There's a wonderful joy ahead. Even though you have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. In this passage, they compare our you know, faith like a clay. 
You know, when you put a, when you make a clay, when you make a jar, you take a mud that's very soft. But then when you test it under fire, when it's burned in an oven, it hardens, it becomes strong. And God says that our faith is, is, is that way too. Our faith does not grow in God simply because good things happen in our lives. We know this from raising children. We know that as children, you know, they have to overcome, they have to learn to overcome hardship in order, in order for them to become strong people. If you always comfort them, if you always do the right things, do things for them, if you always fight their battles, they're going to grow up to be, become weak people. We understand that as parents that they need to have their own suffering and learn to overcome those things in order for their faith to grow. And that is true for, I mean, in order for their character to grow. Same thing for our faith. If our faith is never tested through suffering and trial and pain and hardship, it will never grow. And because of that, we will not be obedient to God as God wants us to be. And that's why the Bible says oftentimes God allows pain and suffering to enter our lives because through that, as we overcome that, God wants our faith to grow. And as our faith grows, we will become more obedient. God allows pain and suffering in our lives. Why? Because God wants us to become better ministers to others. Secondly, so that we may become more obedient as our faith grows. But lastly, God allows pain and suffering to enter our lives so that we may so that we may rely on Him and trust Him more. Some people say that the greatest hindrance in our faith is comfort. What I mean by that is some say that greatest hindrance, barrier, that prevents us from growing, our, growing in our faith is lack of, lack of trial and pain in our lives. That means it is so easy, we become so comfortable in our faith. We become so comfortable in our walk with God. Then you know what? After a while, we, don't, we stop relying on God. We stop trusting in God because we are so used to doing things on our own. We're so used to making it, relying on ourselves. We don't rely on God for our finance. Why? Because we didn't have to. We work every day, we work hard, and we make lots of money. So after a while, we take that for granted. And we don't rely on God for that. Sometimes we see our children, and they're such good children. They grow up, they grow up such, you know, with, you know, become beautiful people, no trouble whatsoever. And we become comfortable in our faith, in our reliance on God. And we don't even pray about our children anymore because they're doing fine without us relying on God. Same thing with our church, our ministry. Sometimes everything goes so well that, you know what, our prayer to God is not as fervent. Why? Because things are going well. And we stop truly relying on God and trusting in God. You know, there's a saying, and I mentioned this, in fact, just a couple of days ago in my office. There's a saying that in a foxhole, no one is an atheist. And the foxhole is a, is a hole that people dig during wartime. It's a hole that they dig to hide, you know, to hide underground from, you know, bullets and bombs, you know, that's flying over. That's called a foxhole. And soldiers, they're in there. And you're, usually when you're in a foxhole, that means you're in the middle of a battle. You know, people say, I don't believe in God. I don't trust in God. I don't need God. But then when your life is threatened, when you're in immediate danger, when you, when they, when you know that you need God, guess what? You start believing in God. You see, that's the truth and reality of human nature. See, too often when our lives are too comfortable, we don't rely on God. We don't trust in God. We don't seek after God. And you see, God loves us. He loves us to death. And He knows that the greatest life that we can lead is a life that God has called us to live. And when we stop praying to God, when we stop relying on God, and when we stop trusting in God, guess what? We're not going to live our lives to the fullest. We're just going to continue to live the life of comfort. You know what? This is comfortable the way it is right now. I don't want anything to come in and, you know, ca you know causing waves. I like things just the way we are. You know what? That is such a tragedy because God has planned so much more than that. And because God loves us, God will not allow us to stay in that bubble. Whether we admit it or not, this is human nature. 
And oftentimes, we don't turn to God unless we're in times of a great crisis. Maybe unless we lose a job. Or maybe someone we know is critically ill. Or maybe we ourselves are ill. We don't turn to God unless there are crises in our lives. I know a father, a while ago, he would never attend a church, even though his wife begged him to go. And she would go to church, she would go to house church, but he would not go. Maybe once in a while he would go to house church, family group meeting, until one day, his wife, he and his wife walked into my office. And the reason why they walked into my office was because their son just ran away, quit school and ran away. He was in high school. And I was the youth pastor. And somehow they had heard. They heard about me because you know I would write I would often write articles that was published in Korean newspaper in Houston. And they thought they thought to themselves, maybe, maybe I can give them advice about this. Because he loved his son. And he didn't know where else to turn to. And he came into my office. And we talked for a while, and I gave him some advice why he would do things. And, and the important thing is not necessarily to get him back, but the important thing is to restore the relationship. And I would tell him, you can't force things upon him because he's not a child anymore. But in the end, what I did tell him was this. You know, changing people's heart is not something that we humans can do. That's something only God can do. And I challenged him that if you really want your son back, that you need to turn your life to God that you need to repent and turn your life to God. And I told him, I know that this is not something that, again, that I cannot force you to do, but it's something only you can choose to do. And I challenged him to go to church and pray and seek God. And I told him I would pray with him. And I told him, as you do that, expect great things from God. And guess what? He decided to, that he would do that. He went to church. Even though he was not a Christian, he went even though he was not a Christian, he prayed and he listened to the Word of God every day. Well, let me tell you right now, he's one of the most faithful members of the church. He's now a small group leader. A while back, I knew, I knew a couple who had a history of causing trouble at church, especially for pastors. In fact, they would go and they would cause rumors I know this because uh, they actually caused trouble and drove out one of the pastors of one of the churches that I used to attend a long time ago. They were very arrogant. They were very arrogant, judgmental. And to them, church was more a religion. It was not a relationship with God. So they said to themselves, you know what, this is, you know, everything was in a very in a worldly and fleshly way. Uh, they were very, they looked down on the pastor. And they, expect, they, they thought that pastors were there to serve them. And if what pastors said or did did not please them, he would get on them. Well, they used to own an a auto body, body shop. And one day their business failed. And after their business failed, they decided to open up a sandwich shop in Houston. And they did, but that didn't last, and that failed too. And about... Three years after they drove out this pastor, one day, and they stopped going to church after that. And one day, I saw them at my church. Of all places, they were at the new members' banquet. And my mother knew them. And I asked my mother, I said, what are they doing here? Because <laughs> I was a little surprised. And then my mother shared the story with me. And then as soon as this man made eye contact with me, he ran over to me and he shook my hand and he said, I'm just very happy to see you. you know, and if there's anything that I can do to help you, you know, just ask me. And he did. He helped out in the youth ministry quite a bit. And what happened to this man was this. All this time he'd been going to church. He heard God's word. But in the, he was up here, but he never went down here. And church was not about relationship with God, but it was about religion. And he realized how wrong he was. After he lost, you know, his business failed, he tried so hard on his own, but it didn't work. And in the end, 
God spoke to him and he realized that the real problem was not that his business failed. The real problem was that he needed to repent. He had sin in his life and he needed to repent. He needed to say sorry to God. And when he realized that, he truly repented. And he said he wanted to start over. So he said, you know, I want to start over. And I'm going to start from the bottom. Whatever you ask, whatever church asks, I'm just going to serve and I'm going to worship God. I'm not here to cause any trouble. I just want to worship God and serve Him. Again, a few years later, he is now also a shepherd, a small group leader of house church. And he, every time there's a conference, he's the first one there setting up tables, folding chairs, spreading out tables. Whenever we have an event, one time we had a youth retreat. He came, he and his wife drove two and a half hours to the retreat center to cook breakfast for us and then went back. Sometimes God allows pain and suffering in our lives so that we may learn to trust Him and rely on Him again. I had a good friend, his name was Ken, who really enjoyed, we grew up together at church in high school. But then after high school, he went on his own way. He was into gangs, partying, girls, drinking, and all those things. I would oftentimes invite him to church, but he would refuse. But one day, one day, I met him. And one day I asked him how he was doing, and he began down to cry, tears down his eyes. He said, you know, Paul, you know, my life is messed up. I don't know what to do. I have a baby out of wedlock. They have a baby without getting married. And I wanted to marry her, but now she doesn't want to marry me. And she wants to separate from me. And the court says, I have to pay child support. He says, Paul, I don't know what to do. I don't have a college education. And the money that I make goes mostly to my kids. He says, Paul, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. That day, I shared with my friend Ken about Jesus Christ. I said, Ken, I don't know what to do either. But I do know someone that can help you. And that is God. Will you trust Him? Will you lean on Him? And that day, we prayed together. And my friend Ken received Jesus Christ into his life. And he went to, he did discipleship programs with me. He did experiencing God. He did all this survival kit, all these things for the next uh, few months. The final story I want to share with you in this point is, you know, I have a, my mother has four sisters, no, three sisters, three sisters. I'm sorry, four sisters. And uh, the youngest one, my mother is the fourth, fourth daughter out of the five. And the youngest one, she married a man and, and they live in California. And my aunt, youngest aunt, she's a wonderful godly woman. She goes to early morning prayer meetings every day. She gives generously to the church. Whenever they have events at church, she's the first one to go help cook and help serve. And she's not a young lady anymore. She's a, you know, just a few years younger than my mom. So she's about, about 65 years old. But one thing that, that, that was a thorn in her life, I guess, was the fact that her husband was not a Christian. He was a good man. Let me tell you, my, husband, my uncle really was a good man. He was a, he was a Caucasian American guy. He was really a good, good man. He was very generous to us when we moved to America you know, 30 plus years ago. And he helped us when we needed him. But he did not believe in God. But he would go to church, in fact, to appease his wife. Because my aunt wanted him to say, I want you to go to church, honey. I want you to go to church. So he would actually go. So in that sense, he was a good man. But he would not give his life to God. Because he said, you know what? I don't need him. I lived my life without God all these years. I don't need him. A few years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. It was, it was a shock to him. And then when he found out that it was incurable, that he was going to die, he went through this great depression. You see, in the past, my mother would talk to him about God and church all the time. But being a gracious man that he, was, he is, he would oftentimes just laugh and be kind and says, okay, okay. He would agree, but he would never do it with his heart. He said, you need to go to church. And he said, okay, I'll go. He went. But he never gave his life to Christ. But after this cancer, you know, a few days before he was to die, I actually flew from Fort Worth, Texas to California. 
because I wanted to share with him about God before he died. And, and this man, who for years and years, years and years and re years, rejected God. But this time when I came to him, when I talked to him, he could barely speak because of the cancer. When I talked to him, when I grabbed his hand, he actually grabbed my hand together. And when I shared with him about Christ, I could see tears flowing out of his eyes. And I prayed with him that day. I didn't know whether he, could, he did it, but in my heart I know that he did. And we prayed together to receive Jesus Christ into our lives. Again, I don't know why all these bad things happen in people's lives, especially good people. Good people like your, yourselves and me. But sometimes God allows these things to happen. Why? Because God wants us to become better ministers to others. How can we minister to others? How can we help others who are hurting when we ourselves have never experienced that in our lives? And God sometimes allows pain and suffering into our lives. Why? So that we may depend on Him. So we may become more obedient to Him. Sorry. Through our suffering, it, it hardens our faith. It makes our faith strong. And sometimes God allows pain and suffering into our lives so that we may trust Him and depend on Him. But before I close, I want to share this one final point. I want you to know this. I cannot give you all the answers as to why these things happen. But one thing that I can share with you is this. That God cares and loves you all. Loves all of us dearly. And God's plan and desire is really for good things in our lives. In John chapter 10 verse 10 it says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. What I want you to know is this. That no matter what goes on in your lives. No matter what difficulties that you may be enduring. Know and believe that God's ultimate purpose for you is for a rich and satisfying life. So believe that no matter what, He's doing it for the betterment of us, our faith. And know that whatever trouble and trials and hardship that we're going through, that God wants us to trust Him. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, it says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. And know, lastly, that no matter what happens, know and believe that in our greatest time of need, that God never leaves us. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, it says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged. For I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. And I will uphold you with my righteous, victorious right hand. Let me close with one final story. And I shared this story before, but I want to share it again. In August of 1932, Reverend Thomas Dorsey, Dorsey, he was on one of his speaking engagements, one of many speaking engagements that he led. But on this occasion, Reverend Dorsey was somewhat nervous because he had to leave behind his wife that was about to give birth. One evening while he was on stage, and just as he was about to begin his presentation, a man from the, uh, behind the stage walked up to him and handed him a piece of note. He opened the note and he read it. And upon reading the note, Reverend Thomas Dorsey turned around and walked off the stage. On that note, it read, it was a telegraph. Your wife went into labor. Stop. There were complications. Stop. Both your wife and the baby did not make it. Stop. Upon reading the note, without a word, he said he left everything behind not his clothes, not even his, I mean, not even his bags or clothes. 
he left everything behind and he headed straight for home. And he says that once reaching his home, he went straight to his study, locked the door, and did not come out for seven days. For seven days, he said that he did not eat, speak to anyone, or say a word. The housekeeper would often stop by and leave a food and tray in front of the door, but he said the food was never touched. This man was utterly devastated. In one swift moment, he had lost everything that he loved and cared for. So for seven days he wept, but more importantly, they said he prayed. But one day he decided, and in that study there was a, a piano. He said one day he decided to sit on the piano, and he says this melody came to him. And in the midst of his despair and grief, he began to compose a song. And the song that he composed was the most, is one of the most classic and popular Christian songs of our time. And it's titled, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Let me read the lyrics to you really quick. And keep in mind what this man just went through. The lyrics that he wrote says, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my light is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near, and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Again, I say to you, when bad things happen to good people, I can't say for sure exactly why these things happen. But one thing that I do want to share with you is this. In those moments, God cares for you. God is there. He will never leave you. So I challenge you all, in your times of greatest need, turn to God, just like Reverend Dorsey did, and trust Him. And when you do that, he will guide our feet, take our hands, and lead us home in him. That's his promise to us. Let us pray.